I'm really excited to see the turnout today. Um, we've had uh, a few webinars where we've crossed 100, and I think today we've done that again. Um, this shows the tremendous demand and interest in global bioethics around the world. And uh, I'm just so privileged uh, that uh, on behalf of George Washington University's Milken Institute School of Public Health, and in particular, our bioethics interest group, uh, welcoming all of you uh, to our 10th webinar session on ethics and COVID-19. I'm really excited today, not only because it has our 10th webinar, uh, but two amazing panelists join me. And by way of disclosure, I consider them my friend and colleagues. So uh, I'm even more excited having known uh, both of them for several years and the quality of their work. But I'm actually also super excited uh, seeing that over 130 people are joining us from around the world. Uh, this is really important. I have been in the field of uh, bioethics for over 25 years and finding six people in the early days to do global bioethics was a challenge. Uh, and now uh, finding all of you uh, uh, who are interested in taking time from your busy lives to come and attend our webinar and contribute to it is just remarkable. So thank you very much to all of you. Today, we start a series in which we are going to talk about uh, the international context of bioethics and COVID-19. Um, today is our first webinar on this series, but we will actually uh, start a journey. This journey will cover several continents. So uh, stay tuned to this space. We will visit Africa. We will go to Latin America, to South Asia, to East Asia, to the newly independent states, and many more. And we hope to have regional experts from those regions joining us. Today, I'm privileged that we kickstart the international context discussions with two amazing personalities who've spent a lot of time in this field. Um, I'm going to request each one of them to provide a 10 minute opening reflection based on the work, what are they specifically doing, with particular reference, of course, to COVID-19 and bioethics, uh, but they may talk a little bit about the general situation as well as time permits. Uh, let me begin, first of all, uh, by introducing our first panelists. And before I do that, just a reminder that the chat board is open for you. Please put your comments on it, and we will be monitoring that, of course, for the discussion section. So I want to welcome Catherine Litter. Uh, Catherine has extensive experience in global health ethics and global research and governance, as well as policy. Um, she joined the global health ethics team at the World Health Organization in Geneva, a senior ethics specialist and co-lead, and has been leading for the past two years work from that unit. And in fact, I got to know Catherine when she was still at the Wellcome Trust and co-led the global policy team there. Um, and frankly, uh, that team did amazing work, not only uh, relevant to the field of global policy, but also in particular, uh, global bioethics. Catherine has been uh, on several advisory committees and technical working groups. I don't need to go through them again, but I hope Catherine that you can share your screen and uh, begin now uh, to tell us a little bit about the international context from your perspective on COVID-19. Thank you for joining us, Catherine. I know how busy you are and over to you uh, for some opening reflections. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Fantastic, and everyone can hear me clearly? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Adnan, for the very flattering introduction. I hope I can uh, live up to that. Um, it's gonna be a bit of a challenge too. You might need to cut me off. Um, I'm known as a speaker, but also 10 minutes, 10 minutes is uh, hard to do justice to the last seven months of work. So I, I am going to try focus on COVID in particular. I will pull out some reflections because as Adnan said, I spent, I spent the last 15 years prior to being at WHO um, in global policy. Uh, so I will have some reflections really with that kind of governance, ethics, policy mindset. Um, and I know that also Carla will pick up on some of the work because she's been engaged in, in the work that we've been doing. So I want to focus on two, two main bits, really the work that the ethics, the WHO's global ethics working group has been focusing on. Um, and then the second piece of work, which I think is relevant actually to your network, what Adnan was talking about, what you've set up there, is really the establishment of um, FEPRAM, which is the public health emergency preparedness and response ethics network, which was established in January. So I'll come to that at the end. 
Um, but I will start with what will seem like a whistle stop tour of some of the work we've done, but hopefully at the end, there'll be time for a bit more reflection on it. Some I'll go into detail um, and some I just don't have time for. And I know, as I said, Carla will pick up on a few things like Muri, for example. Um, okay, my slides are not. Some reason my slides yeah you have to click on your click on your slide first anywhere and then you will see right at the bottom um there you are yeah yep thanks Adnan. okay so uh, as i said i'm going to talk about first about the who's ethics working group which was established in february 2019 it really was established to support the r d blueprint at who so i think that's important it was originally established to focus on research, but has now clearly shifted direction as doing a lot more on public health response as well. Um, it's important to note that's got 19 members from representing all WHO regions. We also have all our um, WHO regional ethics focal points, uh, Carla of which is one from PAHO. And that's really, we're trying to bring that connectivity between what we're doing at the global level and trying to connect that to the regional and the local level. So I think this is a really fitting start to your series on international and really how you make this connection between the global, the regional, the local, and how you balance global guidance and global advice, which the need to be regional and contextually specific. And I don't think this is unique to COVID, but I think this is a really big challenge in ethics, getting that balance right. Um, so yeah, we set this up. We've had uh, we initially for four or five months had weekly meetings with regular updates. We've shifted to fortnightly. That's every two weeks. We have we developed a work plan to start with, which was incredibly difficult. I think in the face of the uncertainty at the beginning of the outbreak. I mean, we're not the only ones, but you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, we really didn't know what we didn't know. We felt like we were chasing our tail. There were so many things we could have focused on. It was really challenging to develop that work plan. But as I said, partly how we develop that is being responsive to the needs of the blueprint team, the emergency team at WHO, technical units, which were grappling with, you know, malaria, having to give malaria advice that might be contradictory to some of the advice that's coming out for COVID and really trying to help them with some of this balancing act, as well as um, the other R&D blueprint working groups, WHO established nine in total. Uh, important to note, there's also a social science working group, which has done actually a lot of the work that I think traditionally an ethics working group might have done in the past, but really important to note that. Um, so I think we've been responsive to needs of others, but I think we've also tried to be proactive in um, looking at what we can develop. On the right hand side of the slide, I put what were the objectives and we modified them in July really um, to take account for the change over the six months that we had seen. And really, I think to, to look at the second wave and try to take stock and really think about what we're focusing on going forward. So what are some of the outputs that we've done? So I'll focus first on the, the guidance side of things and what, what I'm calling the ethics of research. As I said, we focus primarily at research. Um, so three key guidance documents, a lot more advice giving, but really, I think it's important to know, and I think people forget this, that we actually started in the ethics community at a very good point place. We have a lot of pre-existing guidance of a high standard. Uh, we have the Nuffield report that came out in January on research. We have pre-existing WHO guidance from 2016 all the way back. You can go back through, you can go back through Zika, you can go back through SARS, Ebola, you can keep going back. There's pre-existing guidance. So it was really important to us to build on that pre-existing guidance and SIAMS, of course, as well, and distill that into a short page document. And I think this is a, a key theme we need to keep thinking about. It's this distillation of the amount of information coming out of COVID. And that includes from the ethics community. And then we really, and I think this is important for Adnan, your initiative in terms of research governance and oversight, you know, how do we do rapid review? How do we streamline our, our research ethics review processes, which can be unwieldy, and turn them into something that can turn 
uh, proposals around in COVID, especially you know when getting that research up and running is critical. How can you do that in a fast timeline without sacrificing quality of decision making? Um, and I think so that was the second one we focused on building on once again pre-existing work that had come on the back of Ebola. Uh, so we used some pre-existing that came out of the global summit from 2016, some work there and turned that in. And then the third one in terms of documentation, which is an example of where we tried to be proactive. And this is, you know, in terms of human challenge studies, we saw this as something that people were going to moot given the circumstances of the pandemic and where we were in the need for the development of vaccinations, we thought that surely human challenge studies were becoming an issue. And we already had a pre-existing working group working on uh, human challenge studies, really with a focus of developing global international guidance because uh, of the increase of um, human challenge studies in endemic settings. So we were well placed to do that. So there are three of the kind of ethics research pieces that we um, worked on to start with. Then I sort of frame the next two in a kind of pandemic response. We've moved from the research into the response phase. Um, and once again, we did digital proximity tracing technologies because this came one through our technical departments looking at it and from country offices, really everyone was moving to set these up without the prerequisite ethical guidance. So that was something that we tried to move quickly on as well. And once again, we have some pre-existing work in that global health ethics team looking at AI and ethics at the moment. And then another one, again, looking at resource allocation and priority setting, which has, I think, become the big issue in terms of vaccine allocation um, and diagnostics. So that was another key area that we focused on. Then, as I said, we've had documents, then I classified the other, we've given a lot of advice to technical units and WHO colleagues at the regional and the country offices. And they focused around a very broad area of criteria, anything from actually looking at the solidarity trial protocol as a working group and commenting on earlier versions to looking at issues around the inclusion of pregnant women in research which was a huge issue, as I'm sure Carla will bring up in Zika, and it's not an issue that's gone away. And it's still an issue for which we know that some of the first trials were excluding pregnant women without clear justification. So really another piece of work advising um, on that. And then all sorts of other knock-on effects that have happened around uh, COVID and, and issues around palliative care and disability and aging. And then work, as I said, we've done a lot of work with the social sciences working group. They focused a lot on good participatory practice, which to me is a really tricky one because I, and I'm still grappling with this, and I'd be interested if there are uh, questions or a discussion that we could have on the end on how to do good community engagement in an outbreak. Because I think this is something we are learning as we go along, that timeliness. I know, I think we all agree it's critical, but how you do it, I think is still up for debate. So I think this is a really good discussion to take forward um, into future webinars as well. On the side, I've put outreach activities and I've mentioned, as I said at the beginning, the FETPRIN network, and I'm, I'm gonna come back to that. So I won't, I won't talk about that now, but it's also important to note that we've linked up with the Global Summit of National Ethics Committees and had a webinar where we had over 60 participants. And it's interesting, I think, to see the movement from National Ethics Committees at the big, very beginning of the outbreak, there was a real move to the issue statements I think now that sort of shifted to implementation and how you actually advise governments and what are some of the on the ground issues. Um, so I think we'll have a follow up webinar to see where that the direction of travel for those sorts of issues. What are we working on currently? I so I've given some of the things that we've published and some that we've advised on. So we're, we're working on immunity certificates, which I think is a really interesting one because it's changed over time. So WHO actually has a science briefing on this, which says, you know, outright that the science is in a place where immunity passports are justifiable. But picking up on that, we know that some companies and some countries are still mooting certain forms of, of passports or certificates. So we thought it was critically important to start with that science briefing and build on the ethical issues. That's currently with our publication committee. So hopefully I'll be able to send a link um, for that on soon. But I think now that's also morphing into other types of uh, um tracking advice devices as well that we will look at once again i said looking at ethical conditions for accelerating vaccine research i think this is a big topic 
um, you know, everyone talking about models, what's a realistic model, what's an ethical model, are we promising too much, are we cutting corners? Some of these are really critical issues that I think the ethics community should be getting involved in these debates. Um, we are updating the 2016 WHO guidance on um, monitored emergency use of unregistered and investigational interventions. This has been a big issue across lots of regions. I'm not going to speak a lot about it because I know Carla will pick up on this. And then one other topic we're scoping at the moment is really around migrant and refugee populations. And this is directly responding to four of WHO's regions is this being a really critical um, issue. And then finally, the ACT Accelerator is something we're working on. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this initiative, but this was the initiative that was launched uh, February, March of this year. And this is a global collaboration consisting of governments, uh, public private bodies such as CEPI and Gavi and the global funder involved. And it's looking to accelerate the development, production and, and equitable access um, to diagnostics, treatments and vaccines. Um, so that's our, we're really advising on, on the ethics that. And I think what's really interesting about this that I should have mentioned earlier is the use of the word equitable. Um, you know, so, and I think that's an ethical term, yet some of our technical colleagues might disagree with you what that means technically and what that means ethically. But also, the other point I wanted to make is actually, if you look at the language that's being used around COVID, a lot of it's ethical in nature, solidarity, equity, fairness but it's been poorly and ill-defined by people who are using it. And so that was one of the first pieces of work we did looking at that, defining that terminology. But I guess the question that it's still with me is where we've got with the implementation and understanding of these terms and what's our role as an ethics community to really educate governments and people who are using these terms. So I, I would make a strong case that however you look at COVID, ethics is central to it the terminology, the issues, whether ethics is playing a central role in decision making, I think is one of the questions we as a community right. need to look at addressing and discussing. So we're now turning to, we sort of had a July, August, take stock, we're in this for the long run, stop chasing our towel, what can we do, thinking about what's the future focus for our ethics working group and, and WHO Global Health Ethics Team. And we really came out with a you know, first and foremost, something that has, I think, gets lost. We have some sort of epidemics amnesia, I'm going to call it. You know, we fail to learn the lessons from past outbreaks. We're repeating the same things, rewriting the same guidance, making the same. So really is, what can we do in the middle of the outbreak to help us learn lessons now? I think we need to be putting in the place for preparedness now, looking at some of the key issues. I've only listed three there. I could list 20. Um, but just as a couple that we've had webinars and discussions on, you know, the one that's really interesting is, you know, the, the new types of publishing models and the retraction of big studies because they've been published and the peer review mechanisms, the traditional peer review mechanisms haven't been adhered to. We have all these preprints, all these new models that are coming, not from the epidemic, but they were coming pre-epidemic, that are impacting the information that gets in the public domain. So how do we... How do we deal with that, with that as an ethics community? How do we communicate information? I think these are really important topics. At the same chat, at the same time as this change in the way that we're doing research and publication, we also have social media, which is picking up on all this and adding to the infodemic. And I think for us as a community, once again, I think this is something that we need to work with social scientists and other um, types of disciplines to really look at the ethical implications of this. I put in issues around protection of the most vulnerable because they really, whether you look at aging populations or prison populations or different populations, they seem to be once again most affected and have we protected them. And then I, that is not a misspelling where I have governance with a big G and governance with a small G. That's the governance when we look at oversight of ethics and research ethics. I think it's really important for us to get that right and look to learn future lessons. But I think the big governance is the meta and the micro issues. And that is, who's making the decisions? Uh, who's making the research decisions? Are we doing the research in the right areas? Are we impacting on government decision making? So it's really, I think, as a community, we need to think more about that. The second Catherine, area, just, uh, just a reminder of time. So. Oh, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. So then the second area is we need to keep uh, responding to ethical issues. So 
being really proactive as we can, and I don't think this is easy. I think identifying high priorities in a, in a scope of uncertainty is really difficult, but neglected areas. Um, that I'm going to move on, as I said, going forward to me, what's really important is we've got a plethora of guidance and articles. I'm about to show you some of the articles out there. But how do we translate that into implementation? What does that really look like and how does that benefit populations on the ground? I think it's critically important we continue to disseminate and try to reach out to different audiences. As I said, we're WHO, we need to focus on country support and capacity building. I think it's really important to be, build regional ethics, context specific ethics advice and capacity. Um, I'm not gonna talk in detail because I'm gonna run out of time, but I wanted to just say briefly that we had launched in January this FEPRA network, which is really meant to be a global initiative, uh, providing real time contextual ethics advice, looking to build capacity in global ethics around the globe, um, but also to reach out um, and develop resources. We've also had webinars eight to date. I wanted to show this slide because I think it's really important. On the net, on the FEPRIN webpage, we've been collecting resources. We have 1,362 COVID related ethics resources. Okay, that might be blogs, guidance, policy statements, news articles. That's not everything. But I guess my question to you as an ethics community is that's a lot of information for people to digest. First and foremost, that's not necessarily a bad thing. That could be a very, very good thing. But are we concentrating on the most important things and how much of that is being disseminated to the audiences it needs to get through to? Um, are the topics that you're interested in or you think are critical in your setting on that list or are they being neglected? Um, and then I'll, a couple of issues for food for thought for the discussion. Um, as I said at the beginning, I think it is really important to note that the global health ethics community does have a solid foundation of guidance and experience. And how can we build on that in COVID? And how can we build on that in uh, going forward? And how can we be more collaborative in what we do? I think there is a challenge in focusing on the right topics. I think um, it's hard to know in such uncertainty, what are the right topics? My other issue is that anyone who knows me will tell, tell you that I'm slightly obsessed with governance. And I'm really interested in, in ensuring that we're embedding ethics in decision-making. And I'm not sure we've reached where we need to be with that. So, and that's both from, you know, research design. So ethics not being seen as the gatekeeper of the police case, police yeah. key, police state, but really as an enabler of good quality research. It will make your research better. You do it ethical. And I don't think we've actually reached the point we need to be there. Yeah. Um, yeah. And also finally looking at, you know, what kind of governance advisory models could we be looking at for government for those sorts of, um, and I'll leave it there. Because Thank I know- Thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you, Thank you. I couldn't stop. <laughs> Thank you very much. If you can stop the screen share, we'll quickly yeah. get our last slides online. Thank you, really appreciated your reminder. And um, during the webinar, Catherine, if you want, you can put in some links to some of the resources that you've shown. That will be incredibly helpful to okay. our participants. And I really appreciated your conversation around the language of COVID and how the language around COVID is also important from an ethics perspective. I'm now very excited to introduce uh, Dr. Carla Sainz. Uh, Carla is the Regional Bioethics Advisor at the Pan American Health Organization, of course, which is the regional office of the Americas. Um, Carla has been doing amazing work with PAHO for many years in terms of bioethics, um, including, of course, uh, many, many guidelines, including the issues around Zika, and uh, she also sits on the steering committee of the Global Forum on Bioethics and Research, and of course, used to be an academic before she moved to Bajo. So very excited, Carla. Um, you are our neighbor as well in Washington, DC. Uh, thank you for joining us and over to you for your introduction. Thank you so much, Arnan. It's great to be with you. It's, I was just thinking how impressive all this volume of work was that Catherine presented. And I have to say, she didn't add to the challenges that, that, that this was, this work was done at meetings that started at 6 a.m. Washington DC time, so many challenges there. So, um, as you are saying, can we go, oh, here, I can go to the next slide. No, yes. So, we started in the region of the Americas uh, very early in our, our work on the response to COVID because we had been busy 
lately working on a response to Zika. If you think about it, the, the last public health emergency of international concern had happened in our region. So we were trying to uh, learn from the lessons from Zika and, uh, and at that time we were trying to learn from the many lessons of the Ebola outbreak. And one thing that we learned during Zika, for example, is that we persist on not learning some lessons from the past. So we encounter some similar challenges that we thought we had overcome before, but we also learn, and that's how our guidance was developed for Zika. We also learned that the countries may be experiencing ethical challenges that are not exactly those that, that, that we thought were uh, uh, the, the difficult ones. So we learned the importance of working closely, of listening uh, uh, what the challenges were. So next slide. So going with the, building on this experience, we uh, uh, had the opportunity in uh, September 2008 uh, uh, at, at the Directing Council of PAHO, where member states convene to assess the progress done uh, uh, in, regarding our mandate, our regional mandate to integrate ethics in health and also to assess what were the pending challenges. Where do we need to go? What do we need to do? And it, the countries agree that we have to strengthen our ethics preparedness for emergencies. Next. So with that lesson in mind, we, we started thinking and working and the two pillars of our work at PAHO are research ethics and public health ethics. So because we were doing, as Catherine was saying, a lot of like quick repurposing and trying to, to take advantage of the work we had previously done, uh, when, uh, when the pandemic started, the first thing we did was to, th that we did was to adjust our prior Zika guidance to the context of the COVID pandemic. But when we were, it's interesting that we were having those two areas of work in mind. Okay, research ethics, as Catherine said, like key issue, we have to do research ethically and quickly. In public health ethics, we need the response to be ethical from every angle. And we need, we need to be good with a public health perspective and not just thinking about like little patients and little people, we need a public health eye. And a major challenge in, as was with Zika is that we have to ensure ethical decision-making in uncertainty. Healthcare professionals are used to acting with a robust level of evidence and what do we do when, it, when that evidence is not there? One of the most interesting things though is that, as I said, we have, we have the research ethics pillar and we have the public health ethics pillar, but what we learned is that, wow, the biggest challenges seem to have kind of like in between. Neither research ethics nor standard public health ethics. So next. So, but with regard to research ethics, because we had that renewed mandate from our member states from 2018. We have been working on strengthening research ethics system and we included for our work on research ethics a specific indicator that, which was that countries needed established procedures to conduct rapid ethics review of research during emergencies, epidemics and disasters. So we were working, working, talking, talking, convincing, trying to think how to do this. And we had taken important steps, but truth is no single country had properly established procedures uh, when, um, when the pandemic hit. We had discussed plausible procedures. There was a commitment. There were some even, even some normative documents saying that they had to do this, but they, they did not exist. Next slide. So the first thing that we had to do, because you know, suddenly you're, you're with a pandemic and you need to take this step and it was difficult and no one had time to start thinking. So we were lucky to have Wellcome Trust funding to produce very specific and very practical guidance that did not go straight to looking at ethics review committees as the relevant unit, but took a previous step uh, considering what the best strategies at the national level are. Because we were concerned about uh, avoiding duplication of review processes. So we needed to think, okay, within a region, which, and we identify five ways, which five ways can be used 
by countries to manage this. And then after clarifying that, we went to the SOPs for specific ethics review committees. So, um, and, and, you know, we've been working closely with the countries in the region implementing uh, this, which I have to say in general has been easy because they're very, they're very practical. Next slide. So um, in my title, I was saying ethics in time, in times of COVID, thinking about Gabriel Garcia Marquez, <laughs> loving times of cholera. But one of the things that is particular about these times, these peculiar times in which you are, we, we are in a pandemic, is that back in the day, you used to have, like your, your, the recipients of our technical cooperation were the health authorities, the ethics review committees, and even the researchers. But now we realize that the world has changed and, and everybody's active and you have a public, you have a, a very active public and, and people are talking and, and they want to know about research ethics. So we realized that we also had to produce uh, uh, tools on research ethics for the general public, which is something we had never done before. The people wanted, the people that had nothing to do with research or with ethics wanted to know about research ethics. So that was like an, an, an unexpected, you know, turn of our work. Next slide. So with regard to public health ethics, we had to do it. What, what we had been doing is pretty much training on public health ethics and working on embedding ethics in our public health tools. I work, say, with a vaccine team. So there's an ethics piece in the work of the vaccine uh, team at PAHO. So we have uh, uh, been uh, doing that and again benefiting on previous work uh, for example the the surveillance WHO surveillance uh, um, ethical guidance for surveillance has been incredibly useful uh, uh, for the pandemic you know there's a specific gu guideline 15 is on emergency uh, on emergency but we we try to build on prior work and as Catherine mentioned, one specific issue that was uh, brought up to the light really quickly was the topic of allocation of scarce resources. So we produced some very general guidance, but uh, we mostly worked with countries. And one issue that we noticed is that, that we're still struggling to get a public health ethics lens in this discussion, that we're still going with this medical ethics approach as if these decisions were not about populations, but about single individual, individuals. And that was one challenge that we've had to, to, that we've been dealing with since this started. Next. And as I said, there was the in-between, this middle of the sandwich that we really, uh, well, it was not a new, topic conceptually, it has, be, it has proven to be a, a, a more of an ethical challenge than what we initially uh, perceived. So we usually prove something in a research set setting and once it's proved, we provide it to people. And in the research settings, you, setting, you have protections. And you know, you just give it, you're, you're confident giving it to people because it's proven it already. But now we're having this uh, situation in which Lots of unproven interventions for COVID-19 are being given to the populations and in, in the countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, we're not talking about something the clinicians decide exclusively, but about national guidelines. You give this kit or you do this or you do that. But there's no evidence in support of this. And so we have to, we have valuable WHO guidance that was developed at, uh, at the moment of Ebola, but we needed to do some work on that to making more specific and more uh, easier to be implemented in the region in response to the challenges that our countries uh, were experiencing. And that's uh, the document. We were lucky again to have funding by the Wellcome Trust to produce it. So as Catherine, next, last slide. So as, as Catherine, Catherine was saying, We've done a great progress. We've benefited immensely from this repurposing exercise because we had been working on this. And, but we still see that many challenges persist. Uh, one thing is undeniable, which is that emergencies bring ethics to the forefront. It, it, suddenly, everybody's talking about ethics and that, that uh, uh, helps the work we're doing. You were saying at the beginning, before you can get six people to talk about ethics. Now people that apparently had no interest in were talking about ethics. So uh, we, 
we continue doing the, the same work and uh and the, the the mandate the specific mandate that we have in our in, in the, the region of the americas is to integrate ethics uh, in all the areas of work in health so we continue seeing like okay ethics is the fabric of the response of, as you know we talk all the time with our our uh, uh, public health or response emergency response colleagues but we also encounter there are still this uh, new topics uh, or topics on which that even if, it, if they're not conceptually completely new they're proving challenging so you know how do we manage this evolving evidence i mean this uh, the, the research landscape is very is being more complicated than it's been so prolific that it's just it's, it's a little bit of a jungle and the, the the lot of a lot of evidence is being produced so we it's not just a question about whether this study is ethical it's like oh this is this ethic study ethical a month later and so we're working on on supporting uh, uh, our region to handle that complex and as Catherine said we're facing global allocation uh, um, the, uh, uh, global allocation issues primarily of vaccines and that's again it's a matter of like the lens the level that is really uh, new and you know we all have to keep working on that but yeah can talk about challenges forever thank you <laughs> thank, you. <laughs> thank you very much thank you very much Carla really really appreciate that introduction and I'm particularly um, happy that you've raised the issue of embedding ethics and particularly the consternation around population ethics and public health ethics compared to individual ethics. And I think there has been a lot of confusion uh, even raised uh, during COVID-19 time. So very much appreciate that view from the Americas uh, and of course your personal work in it. Folks, we, um, it's great. We have about 20 minutes now for a, a discussion section. I have been keeping tabs together with my colleagues on the chat board. Um, I'm going to try and get to as many questions as possible, but I may not be able to get to all of them. Um, Catherine, actually, let me start with you first with a clarification. Um, the ACT or the ACT Accelerator and WHO, can you just clarify what uh, the relationship is and what the main goals are there? So the ACT Accelerator was launched late April, if I remember correctly, by WHO in partnership with governments, not all governments, some governments, some public private initiatives and some philanthropic funders. The number one uh, mission is to accelerate um, the production and distribution of diagnostics, therapeutics and vaccines, but to make them globally available. So it's really an agreement to work together on issues around allocation, on looking at some of the challenges. So in essence, WHO has taken a lead, for example, in vaccines, but issues around diagnostics, yeah, WHO is working with um, FIND and PATH and other organisations which have a long experience in it. So it's really, it's really a collaborative um, endeavour which is, is the bottom line, I think. Carla, you might want to add in something from a PAHO perspective. No. Great, great. Thank you very much, Catherine, for that. Carla, so um, you talked also, just like Catherine did, about guidance documents and a few other resources. And the question is, you produce, you're the supplier, but where's the absorption? Where's the uptake? Talk to us a little bit about, Carla, what you have been doing to ensure the uptake of these, uh, these documents and guidance uh, that you are releasing. I think it's a great, that's a great question. And they're like, I would say there are two components to my answer. And one is my previous experience. When I got to PAHO, my first public health ethics regional meeting uh, was to discuss the lessons learned from the H1N1 uh, um, outbreak. And WHO had a great guidance document and it was translated to Spanish. It preceded my, my joining the, the organization. And I remember I, came, I went to the meeting and said, hey, the, 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 the people from the countries talked about all the ethical challenges. And I say, do you know this? No one raised their hand. No one had seen that. So I did, uh, that really made me think that we, we are in trouble if we, if we produce guidance and guidance doesn't reach those who need it. So it became, I mean, I've spent, countless hours of time discussing with Catherine, how do we get reach to implementation? But one conclusion that I reached at that meeting is that there, 
things are getting lost in the process of reaching those who need them. So we established two lists. We, for example, with research ethics, we took the effort to map all the research ethics communities in the region. And so we send it directly to them. And we send directly to all people working on research ethics. So that's one component of my answer. And the second component is that we, we're paid by the countries to help them. So the countries uh, come and say, hey, I need help on this. Uh, so come help me. So there's, that facilitates the process of giving them the guidance because they're very clear that we're here to serve them and they count on that and we will, I'll get the email, hey, I'm the National Health Authority, from, we need help on this. So it, there's also a, a, a demand. That's great, thank you. I don't know, Catherine, if you want to add uh, but, uh, anything on that? Yeah, just, just two points, I think and I think Carla covered it really well. One is, how do you reach the audience? And two is, once you've got there, are you actually producing the material that they want? And I, I think we used to have a model of producing all guidance had to be 60 plus pages long, which no one reads. No one, very few people have the time to read. So I think one of the lessons we're trying to learn and we don't always get it right. So the, the guidance for research ethics committees, the SO, the standard operating procedures, that's an eight page long document that includes all the references and the front page. So that's a, that's a short document. And I think it was Paul who raised the question or what, Paul was one of the people who raised this question. And it would be interesting to hear from the audience. I, I think from my perspective, how do they want to get these documents? What's a good avenue for us to be using? I think Carla gave a great example of a direct mailing list, but I think there are probably other avenues that we haven't thought of that your audience could help us with. So I'd, I'd turn it back on its head and say that we do need help in dissemination. Um, and the research ethics, we have the global um, summer of national ethics committees meeting in September, which will be online, but that will be one way of um, disseminating to them. Over. I agree with both of you. It's, 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 this is not an ideal situation. The demand supply equation has to work better. Um, Carla, in your uh, consultations at the country level, is mental health coming up with respect to COVID-19? Are there concerns around uh, the ethics around that? Uh, not as such, but we're having a huge amount of mental health research being conducted with PAHOS involvement. So, and I'm, I'm responsible for, for PAHOS Ethics Review Committee, for PAHOS IRB. So it is the main uh, topic of research uh, conducted, I mean, not just at individual countries, but conducted at a regional level that we are involved with. Thank you, Catherine. Sorry, I was having some mute, uh, unmuting issues. Um, thank you, Carla. Catherine, I, I want to come to a couple of questions that have been raised on the chat board um, about, does this mean that pre-COVID ethics regulations don't apply? Um, uh, and, and, and does, we are reforming the system? So I'd like you to clarify that a little bit. And because you specifically mentioned it, uh, what incremental impact is COVID having with respect to our uh, pre-COVID subjects research guidance? No, is the short answer. Everything pre-COVID, all the rules apply. But I think you'll find that there are some members of the research community who are making a case for research exceptionalism in COVID because of the demands of the time and because it's a pandemic. And I think there is a strong pushback against that, you know, amending the rules, because the rules on the whole, they apply pandemic or non-pandemic. I think the issue, what we're trying to really grapple with is this time issue. I think we can be more efficient in the way that we do oversight mechanisms and look for that without reducing quality or actually circumventing any of the current or pre-existing rules. So that's, it's getting that balance right. I do think there's some really other interesting questions that are related around different research models that are coming up in COVID that came up in past, looking at adaptive trial design, which are even more important, I think, in COVID because you know, you're, you've got four arms, you want to remove a therapeutic if the evidence is out there that it's not effective and you don't want to give it to a research participant. You want to do that quickly. So I think 
it's really tricky finding this balance between accepting adaptive models that you might not have out with an epidemic, but ensuring that the rules that go along with them are still of a very high standard. But to me, the critical question is, uh, we have to push back on members of the research community who don't, who probably are the same members of the research community who would want to change some of the research ethics oversight rules out with an epidemic or a pandemic. But I'm not suggesting that we circumvent anything. I am suggesting that this is an opportunity for us to look where we can streamline, not amend or not reduce any of the quality issues. I'm sure Carla would definitely have something to add. Yes, debated uh, this. Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree. The ethical standards are the same. The process to review whether those standards apply and the process to oversee approved studies, those processes are different. And they have to be different. We would be all we would be all in the same room if it were not because of the pandemic. We're doing things different, differently, and we have to ensure that a rigorous ethics review is done quickly. And I think we can. We have to avoid double duplications, and we can. We just need to get on this. And uh, but I think it, uh, the that this same question was asked uh, to us. Uh, uh, when we had the Zika outbreak. And I think that to some extent, it, the, the structure of the question is also relevant for the MURI framework, for the stuff that's being offered outside of a research uh, uh, setting, because we have one, the, the moral intuition is, since it's an emergency, it's ethical acceptable to X. And it, X can be do research without ethics review, give people, you know, uh, uh, unproven stuff, just like whatever. And, and no, 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 we do some adjustments in terms of process. In, ca in case of Muri, we do, we have some ethical requirements for that, but it, it's really not the case then because it's an emergency, anything goes from an ethical perspective. On the contrary, the stakes are very high. So I really want to jump on to the, the vaccination debate because we can't leave this uh, panel unless we, we talk a little bit about vaccination. So Carla, since we had you, why don't you start and talk to us a little bit about the ethics of vaccination allocation, um, anything that PAHO is doing or thinking about. Uh, if you want to cover vaccination refusals, that's great. Otherwise, we'll stick to allocation ethics right now in terms of what, what is PAHO thinking? Well, I think that, that uh, what we're working on, the, the challenge we're dealing with is to ensure a fair and equitable allocation of vaccines. And, uh, and I, th I think if I ask you, hey, raise your hand if you agree on a f uh, that, that the allocation of vaccine must be fair and equitable, I am absolutely sure that I would see the how many, like 142 hands up. If I ask you what exactly, what exactly does fair allocation mean, well, the things get a little bit tricky. What exactly does equitable mean? Well, we agree that some priority must be given to the worst of. Who exactly is the worst off? Well, it gets difficult. So we're working on getting this, uh, 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 getting a, a, an ethical framework developed, and of course, uh, and supporting the countries to and, and the region to implement it uh, uh, rigorously. Catherine, do you want to come in on this? Uh, what's being done in Geneva for for this issue? So clearly Geneva's working hand in hand with PAHO, but part of this ACT Accelerator work is exactly this. It's, it's um, going out and engaging member states on exactly what they see as fair and equitable allocation. Uh, so that's, that's a gradual stage process which, which colleagues uh, are still in the medicinal products department still engaging with member states, also engaging with different, for example, at WHO with SAGE, with um, the Vaccines Committee, Advisory Committee with the Ethics Working Group, uh, and with a lot of other groups about what that looks like. But as Carla said, I do think it's, it's complicated. It's something we really need to put a lot of time and effort into, because we'll all agree that things need to be fair and equitable, but getting on agreement on exactly what that looks like, I think is the complex issue here. It and is complex. Let me add one thing, which is one word, 
for the other, the previous resource allocation discussion, we had, we could repurpose. For this one, we cannot repurpose. <laughs> so yeah. it's a work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And to be honest, let's, yeah. let's confront the beast in the room, which is that it is political. It's going to be a political discussion, no matter how X tries to influence it. And we've already seen countries arming in various ways and, and trying to become the first in line and, 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 and trying to play the rules. So, so Catherine, just before you end, uh, what about the ethics around vaccination refusals? This is a really important issue, particularly in some countries, for example, where I am, uh, where vaccination refusals is not a, a very, 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 very small percentage, but in, in fact, uh, what is called the anti-vaxxers group is becoming stronger and stronger. Um, so has WHO been discussing that? Yeah, I think this is a group where the social sciences group are actually starting to do a lot of work. And this is actually where this relationship between information sharing and the relationship with the infodemic is critically important. So building on the back of a lot of work that's been looking at why is there increasing numbers of vaccine hesitancy? So why people are rejecting them in different states of the US might actually not be the same reason for why they're rejecting them. Right. So I think first and fundamentally, Looking at the social science as to the rationale as to why people are doing that is critically important because that will help with the messaging as to why we're making a strong case, evidential strong case, as to why vaccines need to happen. So this is something where the ethics working group's taken a bit of a back seat because we've actually worked very closely with the social science group who are really doing the on the ground research, which I think is critically important to understand. So this is something clearly that WHO and I think a lot of governments are interested in, and we are building on the back of efforts of social scientists who've been really picking up this over the last three to five years to understand what we can do and the messaging that needs to go forward. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm going to ask Carla to comment on this as well, but just to say that uh, at GW, we have an institute for data, democracy and politics, and they've been looking at the analysis of social media with respect to this. Yeah. It is absolutely fascinating, Catherine, that we have, uh, my colleagues are uncovering uh, trends and patterns that uh, on, on, on their ability to debunk facts and, and create myths. But Carla, what's the situation then uh, from a PAHU perspective? Well, we have been working uh, with our immunization colleagues on the topic of vaccine hesitancy because I think it's fundamentally a public health ethics issue people are making an argument, they're making a moral case against vaccination. And that, so that problem gets only solved if we do a moral case for vaccination. So we've been working with our ethics, with our, our immunization colleagues on moral arguments on that. And I think that uh, in general, strengthening public health ethics and strengthening our capacity to produce uh, ethical arguments that have, that the, that address populations and not uh, is what will you know get us a solution of the issue. I'm saying that that's the focus. That's 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 the perspective that we should have because that forces us to move away from the common locus of the discussion, which is me, my individual rights, my body, and we're talking about vac vaccination in most cases for infectious diseases. So it's not like me, my body, and I own, I decide myself as if it were a decision on dialysis. So ultimately, think, we're strengthening those arguments with our immunization colleagues. I think we have to combine what both of you are saying. I think uh, your input on creating the moral argument, Catherine's um, <laughs> perspective on, on doing more social science, as well as a political argument, I think that will be needed. An economic argument is going to be needed. I think we need everything in our, in our armamentarium, so to speak, to confront that. Let me, let me, because I have only four minutes left, we are going to start winding down this uh, webinar now, uh, even though I have several other questions that I would like to get into. Um, Catherine, you know, take a minute to make any final comments that you would have on, on this issue um, and anything in particular that you might want to raise in terms of uh, you know, what, what, are, what are the community? We have uh, over 100 people in the audience right now. How you feel this community can help WHO? Yeah, that's a great question. I think one, one I've already started with my implementation. You know, I, I think we 
as an organization need help in getting our guidance out and implementing it on the country level. We can't single-handedly, I can't do that from headquarters. So, and we need people from the bioethics community to be able to do that in a pragmatic and understandable way. So that's my first call for people on this. I think the other challenge I'm really interested in is working with the bioethics community to better embed ethics in decision-making. And as I said that with a small G and a big G, uh, what kind of dissemination materials should we be producing? How do we need to speak a language that policymakers, the general public, uh, clinicians, uh, public health advisors understand? And I think that's a conversation that gets pushed to the back in COVID because we're busy responding. But I think it's actually an opportunity for us really to make our mark because I think people outside of ethics acknowledge COVID is all about ethics should be forefront and center of it and i don't Thank think it yet so that's to me my plea and i'm very happy to engage with people on that because i'm thanks very much catherine um uh, carla your your response to that well i've been just uh, thinking and, and reading the comments in the chat that are so interesting uh, and, and pointing out in so many cases the instances of misinformation and disinform disinformation that that we deal with uh, uh, and how, how the majority of the people, the public, the community that, you know, we say that the word community to designate such a big public uh, is dealing with. And I, my, my thought is always, what are we producing? What, what knowledge are we, what are we saying to fix this misinformation, this disinformation? And that's what led uh, uh, Pajo to produce uh, uh, documents for the public little videos for everybody, everyone. And I think we have to learn that in the current context, yes, by, I mean, bio, especially because of the pandemic, bioethics has been a field in which everybody's talking about. And we have to all be proactive and talk about ethics and uh, fight that misinformation and then lack, this lack of information, just producing content ourselves too. And I'm not talking about the guidance document or the journal paper. I'm talking about content to be shared among people. Thank you very much. I think that, um, ladies and gentlemen, I know you had many more questions on the chat board that we could not accommodate. There were some questions around populations in conflict and refugees. You'll all be very, very happy to know that our next webinar on uh, two Tuesdays from now on the 1st of September, We'll talk about ethics, COVID-19, and refugee populations. So for those of you who had questions on that, I'm going to postpone those. Come back again two Tuesdays from now on the 1st of September at 12 noon, and we will talk a lot more about COVID-19 and how it affects populations in conflict. Please join me in thanking our just smashing, absolutely wonderful panelists, Catherine and Carla from the World Health Organization and the Pan American Health Organization. I value their input and their partnership together with George Washington University's Milken Institute School of Public Health. It was a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much for joining us today. We hope this has been useful to you. Um, and it is our pleasure to close our 10th webinar on ethics and COVID with such wonderful panelists. Thank you again. Looking forward to seeing many of you back uh, on the 1st of September. Take care now. Bye-bye.